Hi. So finally we got everything, everything settled. Never change a running system. It's a philosophy I've always adhered to. I'm Jeremy, co-founder and CTO of the United Manufacturing App, and I don't like excitement in tech. I know it sounds weird coming from a startup CTO, but let me explain. So it's absolutely crazy out there for enterprise architects. You have a lot of words out there, unified namespace, data warehouse, data lake, predictive maintenance, charting, OPC UA, data lake, Kubernetes, it's, it's all out there. And OPC UA and stuff like this is mostly the stuff that's coming just from manufacturing. But an enterprise architect also needs to consider all the rest of what's going on, procurement, R&D. So they need to take this also all into consideration. And additionally, it's not only about technology, they also need to think about the processes because the best technologies, they don't matter if there are no business processes to support it or if there are no people who want to use it. So let's zoom out and be really boring. Because working with data is not something that's new to manufacturing or that's very specific there. We've been processing data since 60s. So there are a lot of well-established best practices out there to process data. And what we do here is first we will look at the requirements of frontline workers and business analysts through the lens of OLTP versus OLAP databases. I know it's not very abstract, but we will, we will get to that. Then we take a look at how really large companies like Amazon, Netflix, and co, how they are processing large amounts of data through the lens of Lambda and Kappa architectures. And then, as a third point, we bring it all together into an actionable approach so that you can bring all of this boring, well-established stuff all into manufacturing. So that we can answer the final question, how can we connect Tulip with the unified namespace? and with the rest of the enterprise architecture. And with this, I mean technology, process, and people. So let's get started. OLTP versus OLAP, because introducing unnecessary abbrevi abbreviations is always good for understanding. So it's a, this one is a very traditional view on databases, but bear with me, because it will help you in sorting out a lot of these buzzwords. Again, boring stuff, you know this since the 90s. So it's about operations versus analytics databases. There are OLTP databases, means online transaction processing, and they're designed for the frontline workers to get information quickly. They are routine transactions. So let's imagine you go shopping, you buy a pack of milk, um, the cashier scans it, and then the system will go to this type of databases and reduce the amount of products on stock, buy one, because you just bought a pack of milk. And there will be a lot of these very simple routine transactions going on. So the total database will also be quite small in size, maybe gigabytes or terabytes. Um, most SQL databases fit all into that category. So it's all for the frontline people. Contrary to that, we have analytics databases, OLAP databases, online analytical processing, which help analysts to find ways to improve their, their, their company. It's about long running queries. So let's go with the shopping example. So they will take all the data from all the milk that was bought and they will do analysis like when, when do people buy the most, most milk? At which, which time do they do it? Or do we need to maybe use a different brand? It's this, they analyze large amounts of data, terabytes to petabytes. Uh, it's business intelligence, data mining and the technologies used there are data lakes, data warehouses, Azure, it's, uh, it's uh, Synapse Analytics, AWS, it's Redshift. There's a lot of out there. But with this, we can split these two databases up and you find them in every company because this is boring stuff. Now, the next boring thing, ETL. And I know it, it sounds old, but on the next slide, we will suddenly see how stuff can come together. ETL means extract, transform, load. So you have on the top, oh, you can't, can't see it. On top, you have users, 
and they interact with OLTP systems. They're, they're the ones interacting every day, a lot of routine transactions, MES systems with the production order databases, or ERPs with the stock lists. And what you do traditionally, every night you take all the data in there, you extract it, you transform it, uh, adjust the modeling a little bit, and then you load it into a data warehouse so that the business analyst can improve or find ways to improve the company. And now it starts to get interesting because traditionally this was run every night. But at some point of time, companies want to have it in, let's call it near real time. They didn't want to wait until the end of the day or end of the week so that they can find ways to improve their company. So they introduced real-time ETL. So what you do is you have MES, ERP, these systems. They are all basic SQL databases, OLTP systems. And you can now apply something called change data capture, which will take, which will look at the database, and every time something changes in there, will stream all changes to, to Kafka. Um, if you have heard of Kafka, this is exactly where it was originally designed for. And from there on, so this is like the extract step. It's still ETL, extract, then you transform it with stream processing, and then you can load it and send it to the data warehouse. Exactly the same stuff. If you're familiar with unified namespace, you might have heard it already here a couple of times. It starts to look like this. It's, not this, it's really not the same, but it starts to look like this. Because what you have here now is a continuous stream of change events. So every time something changes on, in the factory, you will have it here in Kafka. And you load it in the data warehouse. Second part. Lambda and Kappa architecture, because I'm going to throw more unnecessary abbreviations into here. So Lambda architecture is, again, a very old way of seeing how to process large amounts of data. But it's, it's also not, I would say it's, today it's not used that often anymore, but it really helps in understanding, getting some just basic thoughts on how to process data right. So you have data ingestion layer and if you know, I think a lot of you are engineers, if you think of the Greek letter lambda, it look, looks like this, and this is where the name comes from. Uh, if you put it 90 degrees, it starts to split up. So you have one stream of data, for an, it could be predictive maintenance, it could be vibration data, and then it gets sent to a speed layer and a batch layer. And in the speed layer, what you would do is you could run anything in real time there. A uh, machine learning model which detects is the machine is there a, a fault in there? And every time something comes in, it will automate process good or bad. The same data will also go into the batch layer um, to be stored for historical records. And then every week or every day, uh, you could run analysis on it, like batch process, for example, retrain a machine learning model. And to bring both, both of these information together, you have then a serving layer. So now with one layer, what you can do is you can get real-time data and historical data into the same architecture, into the same dashboards. There are some disadvantages with this. So first of all, all one, example, one famous example for batch, batch layer is MapReduce. It's one technology. It was, some say it was the technology that allowed Google to go, go big in the year 2000, 2004. So again, I'm talking really boring stuff here, really old stuff. 2004, they used it to build the search index. So all websites on the internet, and they used this technology to go through that. And to be honest, I don't think in manufacturing that we'll ever process so much data. Um, other thing is that you need to have two layers, which is complicated, because you need to maintain both of them. So what's coming up more and more is the Kappa architecture, with more and more, I mean, like, it was introduced 10 years ago. Uh, where you just have the speed layer, just unified namespace, where you just process everything in real time, and on top of that, you have either real-time applications or batch applications. Now, to put everything together, there's all this boring stuff, all this existing stuff, put them all into one architecture so that you can apply to manufacturing. One architecture to rule them all, one architecture to find them, to bring them all, and in the lightning bind them in the land of manufacturing where IT or OT components lie. We see it very similar here, what we've seen previously. 
um, just instead of the MES system, we can also put Tulip in here. So let me come to, to, to this side. So what you can do is you can take Tulip and with a connector, and they're also working on MQTT connection, all, every time something changes here, you could send it to the unified namespace. Same with all the SQL databases that you find on the shop floor. Every time ERP, MES, quality management, it's all SQL. And you can use change data capture, so every time something changes, you can have push it, it's a unified namespace as well. And now, because manufacturing is actually a little bit different from all the other departments, uh, because we have also the shop floor. It's not SQL device, it's also PLCs, camera sensors. Um, what you do is you use IT, OT connectivity. There are a lot of solutions uh, out there, and I'm going to focus on that, to send the data from the shop floor to the unified namespace as well. And you see on the bottom here, you see MQTT as well as Kafka. I don't want to go too much into the details here. I've written uh, entire blog posts about the differences and how to combine it. Basically, um, MQTT is very often used for the shop floor because it's a protocol able to handle a lot of unreliable connections. So devices that go online, offline a lot, but it's really bad at processing large amounts of data. On the other side, you have Kafka, which is really bad at unreliable connections, but it's really designed to process a lot amount of data. So with this, you can combine it. From there on, you can now put the Lambda architecture on it. Um, so you can have a, you have everything that's now happening in your factory is available real time in a message broker. Um, just going top down, there are only three ways on how you can connect building blocks or applications in your factory. One, you can do point to point solutions, go connect them point by point. Second, you can connect them through databases. So advantage of point to point, it's easy to do, but as you might all know, it can get very messy. Databases, you send all to one, but real-time use cases are not possible anymore uh, because you always send them through database. And the third one is introducing a new component, a message broker. It's a little bit disadvantaged because you're adding new components and it increases the complexity, but you, um, get all data in a single, in a single place. Uh, you can do decoupling. So every time you change something, you can decrease the cost. So no point to point. So if you have your EPMES connected in a thousand ways um, and it's getting chaotic, if you want to change something, that's, that's unified namespace. From there on, you could, can take it into the speed layer, um, predictive maintenance, we talk through it. You could talk it to the batch layer. You can put it in the serving layer, and now what you can do is you can serve real-time and historical data using boring IT best practices. You can now serve it to Tulip. So now in Tulip, you can ask everything that's going on in the shop floor and also all historical stuff that's been going on. And you have some, a vendor new tool architecture in the middle. And additionally, you can satisfy, let's call it the cloud people, they, the people with the data warehouses, data lakes, they want to have the data. You can subscribe to, to Kafka and then forward it into a data warehouse. This is exactly where Kafka was made for and there is a huge ecosystem to do that. So how we do it at the United Manufacturing Up? So everything, all the blue boxes, are single components. If you would do this type of architecture yourself, you would probably use them anyway. Um, what we do is we provide all of these blue boxes in a single architecture, package everything together, so that's really easy to install. So Tulip, with a Tulip connector, you can send data to Kafka. Um, what's included is Red Panda, it's a new version of, of, of Kafka. Um, using Debitium for the ERP and MES system, you can subscribe to all changes in SQL databases. Now, there's also included an automatic bridge between uh, Hive, uh, MQTT and Kafka. For MQTT, we use HiveMQ. These guys are also here. I see one, one even listening here. And for the shop floor, there are a lot of solutions for ITOT connectivity. We provide some standard components, like uh, to connect to IO link centers, barcode readers, OPC UA. We also include Node-RED, if you know it by default. You can use basically any other tool here. 
And what we now do is, I know it, it looks, looks quite scary, all of these boxes. Um, we kind of, we're not really using the Lambda architecture. We're using the Kappa style of architecture. So all data in unified namespace gets auto, you can process it in real time. And you can even send it back to the shop floor, called reverse ETL, so that you can turn the traffic light on red or green or send signals back to the shop floor. Um, and ultimately stored in, in, in a timescale database. There's a serving layer on top so that in Tulip you can easily subscribe to all real-time data and you can easily sub subscribe to the historical data in the database. And then additionally, uh, we are able to send the data to the data warehouse. We're not focusing on the data warehouse part. It's the, there are a lot of other solutions out there. And that is one part one pillar of what we do at the United Manufacturing Hub, it's the technology part. So at the beginning, I said technology, people, processes. So what we just talked about is technology. Uh, data infrastructure, uh, Kafka, MQTT databases, that's one part. The other part are processes, because you need to put all of this, you need to have, especially large enterprises, something in the organization to support it. There need to be processes to do it. So what we provide is a device routine infrastructure, Kubernetes, Linux, Docker, which allow you to update everything, keep everything up to date, um, basically the entire life cycle of it. And now, because there's also a third component, it's all best practices now, everything is, is cool, but there are still the people. And you need, if you just throw people, if you throw them Kafka on it, uh, it's manufacturing, they probably don't want to use it or they cannot use it. So what we do is with our management console, we put a layer on, on top of it. A, you could call it a, a, a console, which gives the engine, which puts all of these tools into the hands of the engineer so that the engineer sees, can work with the data infrastructure, that they can work with the device and container infrastructure, that they can update devices, that they can, that they are alerted if something goes wrong. So it's, also talking about processes, there is a tool which will create tickets in their help desk, whatever. If there is no data coming in from the MES because someone plugged a PLC cable out, happens way more often than you might think, and will show you instead of having to do hundreds of codes, it will show you in a couple of, couple of seconds. So, coming back to the original statement, never change your running system. When connecting Tulip with the unified namespace and enterprise kind of, and architecture, don't try fancy stuff. Be really boring. Use well-established best practices that are out there to, to let you guide you through the chaos what enterprise architecture is. And if you want to have more content like this, you can follow me on LinkedIn. I put my name there if you want to, to add me on, on LinkedIn. You can also uh, follow us on uh, on LinkedIn, on Unit Manufacturing Up, where we write about what's the best MQTT broker to, to, to select, what do you need to think about, and a lot of other topics. Or you can come to our booth. We are there in the partner section, and I would be happy to see you later. <laughs>